Welcome to the Weekly Word, and thank you for tuning in. This is our weekly online devotional for those of you who can't join us for our Sunday morning worship service at 9.30 a.m. If you live in the Vail Valley, though, we highly recommend you come. We'd love to plug you into community, live worship, and a sense of belonging. Here at Gracious Savior Church, we have a mission of loving Jesus, each other, and all people. If you see anything on the screen right now that interests you, let us know. But here's a couple ways this summer that we're engaging with this mission specifically. We have a suicide loss support group every Monday in June at 6 p.m. at the Single Tree Community Room. This is for people who've lost a loved one due to suicide. If you know someone or you yourself are going through that pain, please come to the suicide support group. We are replacing Brewology with Grillology. Up Valley will meet at me, Josh's house, Wednesdays at 5 p.m. And Down Valley will meet 
Tuesdays at Jason's house at 5 p.m. If you want to get in touch with me, dial 970-393-6267, and then you can reach out to Jason for the Down Valley details. Pay attention to the dates. It's not all summer. Mine starts in late June, and Jason starts in mid-June. We are also starting a mountain bike group. If you want to get involved with that, if you have a passion for biking out in the outdoors, text Matt at 832-552-2793. We also have our prayer group. Our prayer group is split up into two groups. So you have twice the opportunity to connect with Jesus and others. Thursdays at 6 p.m. starting June 16th. And the next day is June 17th. Friday's at 9 a.m. We also have a men's camping trip at the end of July. If you're interested, RSVP on our website. Shoot us an email. Let us know that you want to come. And the summer games are August 8th through 12th. Registration is now open on our website for kids 3rd through 8th grade. Woo! That's our summer of awesome events. And now here's a message from God's Word with Pastor Jason. This week you get me instead of Pastor Jason because Pastor Jason is off visiting family in California. So he gets to give away his Jasonness that we all love and appreciate to his family members, which is fantastic. I'm sitting here at the altar today because, well, this is the place where um, we break the bread or we present the bread of the Lord's Supper. He said the night that he was betrayed, that's Jesus breaking the bread, that this was his body broken for us. And in the Gospel of Matthew, that's, that's a callback to something earlier that happened in the story. It's a story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's a classic story, one that you've heard a hundred times, I'm sure, um, both in Sunday school or Bible studies or depicted in movies. The, the, the hit TV show, The Chosen, is going to be showing that event in their season three. But let me, let me retell you that story. Um, with a fresh set of eyes. So imagine that you're the disciples and you just follow Jesus, it's what you do, but then there's this big crowd of people who've been who've been kind of almost harassing him. Just his cousin just died, John the Baptist has, has recently been been killed, and Jesus just heard about it, and he's been going off into these quiet places to pray, but the crowds won't stop chasing him down. You could liken this to being at a funeral for someone you, uh, for, and, and, and a friend of yours lost someone they love and people keep on bothering them at the funeral and, and you just kind of want to say, leave them alone, please. But Jesus, he is capable of not being left alone. He's, he's able to handle it, but you got to imagine it's exhausting for him. He must be so worn out. He's literally gone across the Sea of Galilee, a massive lake, in order to get away from these people, and they keep on chasing him down. But he sees them, and he has compassion on them, so he starts healing their sick. And he's healing and healing and healing and starting to get late. And you as a disciple, someone who loves Jesus, and he has an affinity for the crowds, so you're going to have an affinity for the crowds too, right? You're going to care about them. You eventually say, Jesus, hey man, it's getting late. Shouldn't we send these people away into the local villages so that way they can get something to eat tonight? We gotta cut it off. So the disciples, they have compassion on the people. And, and so if you were there, you probably would too. But Jesus says something amazing. He turns to the disciples. So you can imagine looking to Jesus and you're just looking out for him and looking out for them. He's very compassionate. He's been healing them, but, but you gotta cut it off. And then you can imagine Jesus turning to you and saying, they don't need to leave. You give them something to eat. Me? Well, okay, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Essentially, you have enough to make two sandwiches, right? With some, and then an extra little piece of bread to stop up the juice is essentially what they're saying, you know? And you go to Jesus and you explain that to him and he asks for the fish. He asks for this little measly scrap of a meal that you have. You give it to him and then he thanks God for it. He tells the people to sit down. There's a lot of people. So what he says is he, 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 he calls out, 
Everyone sit down, find a place to sit. Yeah, settle down. And then the word spreads out throughout the crowd and, and this thousands of people are sitting down. Then he takes the fish and the bread, he looks up to heaven and he gives thanks. And then he, he, he gives, he breaks the bread and he gives some bread to you. And then he says, go and give this to others. Go and, go and give this piece of bread to someone, to, to the, that family over there, okay? And then he goes to your friend, another disciple, and he breaks another piece of bread, gives it to them, and he gives them, you know, a fish. And then they turn around and he says, he says go and give that away too. Um, to me, that family over there. Oh yeah, and, and then Simon, you know, would you mind? Yeah, thanks. Oh, and, uh, and uh, Andrew, would you? Thanks, I appreciate that. And it keeps going and going and going. And it never stops. Every person is satisfied by this meal. The bread and the fish just don't stop. Then, not what's more is that people start saying, oh no, I've had enough. I've, I've had plenty. And so as they start to clear out and head home with their bellies full, you know, you start picking up scraps and you have 12 baskets left over of scraps. That's a lot of food left over. And then you go to a buddy of yours and like, dude, did you ever get a count? Did, did, did Matthew over there, did he by chance count up everyone who is here? And then they're like, yeah, he said there were 5,000 people here. And that's just the men, actually. So there were more than 5,000 people. Not, I mean, we just counted the, the, the heads of each family, the men. I mean, we're not even counting the women and children at this point. There were just too many. 5,000. At least fed by Jesus. It's an amazing story. And, and every single thing you read in the Bible will have a biblical meaning. It will have something that, so some deeper meaning, some significance inside the text itself. And it's probably cross-referencing to other places and whatnot. And if you take that, and if especially dealing with Jesus, if you read that and read into it, you can walk away with something that changes your life personally. So let's talk about the biblical meaning of this text. So there's a couple of things happening. One is that the idea that, that these people, that they're just so lost and Jesus has so much compassion for them, but they followed him out into the middle of nowhere. The disciples say, we're in a remote place. And so Jesus has led them into a remote place, a, a desolate place, a wilderness, you could say a kind of desert. And the thing is, what's so cool in the Old Testament is that God led the people out of Egyptian slavery, out of that tyranny, but he led them into the desert where there's not a lot of resources to, to help a civilization thrive. But then God provides bread from heaven, you know, manna. And that word means, what is it? Because it was just so mysterious. What is this? They would walk out and they'd be like, oh my gosh, there's just bread, just dough all over the place on the ground. And then they would, you know, cook it into a, a baked bread. And Jesus, he kind of mimics Moses in that way by, by asking God and giving thanks and being the leader of the people and, and by God providing that bread. It's, it's kind of like a replay of that, which is really cool and, and kind of talks about how faithful God is and how good he is, how kind he is. You know, and then there's a leap forward. I, I mentioned already, we're at the altar today because later on Jesus would, would break bread again and give it to his disciples and say, take and eat. You know, this is my body broken for you. And then after supper, he would drink from the cup and then give it to them and say, drink ye all of it. Um, and, and this is my blood given for you for the forgiveness of your sins, shed for you. So it's the idea that not only can Jesus, not only was Jesus capable of meeting these people's physical needs, he is capable of meeting their spiritual needs too. The chief of which is salvation. We all need a, a substitute for us 
to, to give their life for us, to die for us, and that, that one is Jesus. We need that, our sins to be forgiven. And so those are some of the biblical meanings, and there's a lot more going on here, for sure. Like you have the image of the disciples, and this is, I think, that the meaning that's most relevant for us on this Sunday is the, the idea that the disciples are almost like priests. You know, priests, they act as someone who goes between you and God, right? And the disciples, they kind of come between the people and Jesus. If you're reading the text right now, you know, you might have noticed that, how the disciples come to Jesus with their idea. Jesus comes back at them with his idea. Then they have to bring him the food. And Jesus doesn't give the food to the people. He gives the food to the disciples who then give it to the people. And that's a very priestly image. The idea of someone who's, 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 who's in contact with God, in contact with his blessings and his goodness, and their chief responsibility is to spread that goodness to others. Let's talk about our local, we're, he, technically we don't call him a priest, but Pastor Jason, who I can pick on because he's not here. Um, he is a, an awesome pastor. And he's working in his pastorshipness the best when he's going to God and receiving blessings and spreading those blessings to you, the congregation, and to me, his coworker. You know, when Jason is operating in Jesus's goodness and sustenance and resources, his peace, his love, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing to receive from him. But the thing is, is, is Pastor Jason isn't the only disciple. You guys are disciples of Jesus too. We're all called. We're all called to go to Jesus like the disciples with the very littleness that we have and receive what he can give us. But it doesn't really work that well if we just keep it to ourselves. We have to give it to others. You, you might have noticed we're going into the personal meaning. By reading into scripture, we've, we've unlocked a, a truth about life as we know it. A deep philosophical truth that can significantly change our lives. But what I just said is probably really hard for some of you guys to hear. You don't want it to be the truth. You don't want it to be the personal meaning. You'd much prefer me to say, Jesus loves you, he died for your sins, and he did, and move on. But Jesus doesn't do that, and neither does the scripture. We have such a clear image of the disciples coming to Jesus, and then turning around and going to the people. It'd be so foolish for us to ignore it. So this is the calling of this text. The question, that it asks, are you going to Jesus for his resources? Or are you just giving out of your resources? Let's look at our lives. We've got so many demands, big demands, like a crowd of 5,000 men, not including women and children demands. <clears throat> I think of two population groups close to my heart, nurses and teachers. Um, nurses, because I know some nurses, and uh, you know Jason's daughter is a nurse in Colorado Springs. And in the age, even before COVID, but in the age of COVID, there is I, I can't think of a vocation that has had more demanded of it. But right up next to it are teachers, and I'm just close to the heart of teachers because I teach some, but my dearest friends and my own wife are teachers. But in this era and day and age, and even before, the demands put on teachers are outlandish. They're crazy. Especially nowadays, it's so hard being a parent that much of the needs of parenting are auctioned off to the teachers. And so the teachers don't really get to teach. So they have to auction off some of the emotional needs of their students to paraprofessionals such as school counselors. And then the school counselors, they have the, the, the trauma from COVID on these, especially younger children, 
um, is so deep that they have to, you know, re-auction off so much of that counseling stuff back to the parents. And you can see it's a cycle of scarcity. It's a cycle of scarcity. We see this play out in the text. We see this symbolized in, in our story. Our, our, our biblical episode of the week where the disciples say, let's send them out to the towns to be fed. They knew that their resources weren't enough for the job, their five loaves and two fish, and they knew that the need was serious. But their idea was to either A, try to meet this need with our limited resources, in which case we'll fail, or B, just auction off to others. And you know, it's a wise decision. It's a good choice. And it's one that is often the appropriate choice today. We need to have boundaries. My wife cannot meet the need of every child in her classroom. She just can't, it's, 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 it's impossible. Nurses cannot work 48 hours in a row and live a healthy life. It's not possible. But there are some needs that must be met. And it's tragic when we can't meet them. There's needs to love our spouse, to come home at the end of a, of a hard day with enough resources to, to, to give them affection and, and commitment. There's needs on the part of our children for us to, to continue loving and being patient with them, to give them wisdom and love and guidance. There's, there's needs that cannot be ignored in our jobs, to do well, to act with integrity, to, to make sure that we're acting within our passion enough to where we avoid burnout. Those needs are real and they cannot be ignored. And many of them should not be auctioned off to others, although we are tempted to do so. But if we're very honest, brutally honest, I do not have the resources to meet the needs. And if I try, I will run out of resources before the need is met. Leaving those I love hanging, waiting for me to show up. And I just can't. I have nothing left. The world's answer is to auction off those needs or to, to, to have selfish ways to replenish our resources. But that's not Jesus's way. Jesus's way for certain occasions is to admit our lack of resources and to come to him with that lack, with that scarcity and trade it for his abundance. We see the disciples do this in the story. Jesus makes them point out their scarcity. He brings them into his trust to exercise faith, to exercise them first admitting the need and then their scarce resources. And Jesus says, you have the resources, but you have to come to me first. And Jesus models for us the, the thankful attitude and the preparation for the people around him to, to receive something good. And he takes the, the, the bread and the fish and he looks up to his heavenly father and he gives thanks. And then he sends us out to love others. So really, the way of the world says there's not enough resources to meet all these needs. But the kingdom of God does not respect our reality. It respects God's vision. And in God's world, in God's kingdom, because of Jesus, there's always enough. Because of Jesus, there's always enough.
Don't believe me? Listen to this story. And after you listen to it, ask yourself, does God have enough for my needs? There's this, I read this story in a book called Surprised by the Power of the Spirit by Jack Deere. I highly recommend it. He's talking about a, a missionary he knew. She was from Asia, or she was working in Asia, but she came to the United States to sort of recharge. She was so burnt out, and, and her resources were so poor emotionally, uh, mentally, and financially. She was seriously doubting going back to the mission field. She kept on having this dream, and in this dream, Jesus, she sees him whipped and beaten and scourged and bleeding, and he turns to her and he says, because I died, there is always enough. Because I died, there is enough. And he would take parts of his flesh and give it to her. Strange, cryptic, obviously supernatural to my mind. She decides to go back to Asia, knowing that she doesn't have the resources to meet the need. And then there's a sort of political problem in the city. All the orphans that she's in charge of they come flooding to her home. Her house is filled with children who are hungry and dying. There are so many of them that they're packed. And they're so packed that urine is flooding in the hallways. It's a truly desperate, scarce situation. A friend of the missionaries comes from the U.S. Embassy knowing that the missionary's family herself she, have not eaten in five days. She brought a meal to be kind, but just for the family, not knowing all the orphans were there. She shows up to the house and realizes how scarce um, th what she brought was, that she didn't bring enough for all these orphans, just the family. And so she brings the food and says, it's not enough, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, let me go back to the embassy and get more. But the missionary says, no, we'll make it work. So this little meal, she puts it in a pot in her home and finds like a little bit of cornmeal, but it all fits in like one, one pot. And she says, kids, come eat. And these dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of orphans gather around. She grabs some paper bowls and her own plates and stuff and decides that from the very beginning, she's going to give full servings. She takes the spoon, dips it into the meal, puts it in the bowl and gives it away. She does this again and again and again. And it didn't stop. The food did not run out. Every orphan and family member ate their fill that day. That's an amazing example of us showing up with our scarcity and God showing up with his abundance. But there's a better one. It's what this altar represents. When we show up to church on Sunday, when we show up to Jesus in our heart the first time that we hear the gospel, we show up with nothing, less than nothing. We show up with the liability of our sin. And Jesus is so good and the Father is so powerful and the Holy Spirit is so present that they are able to take the scarcity of our sin and erase it and show up with the abundance of God's mercy and love. Your sin your wrongdoing, your shame, your guilt, your desperation, your addictions, your brokenness, your self-image issues, and your energy levels, your tiredness in your job are nothing compared to the abundance of God's love for you, his forgiveness, and his sustenance, his resources. So we've gotten comfortable probably. If you're a Christian listening to this, you, you've probably gotten really comfortable with the idea of going to God with your scarcity of your sin and your brokenness. 
But have you gotten comfortable with going to God with the scarcity of your energy, with the scarcity of your time, your finances, the scarcity of your, your resources in light of the demands being put on you? What would that look like if you did? If you acted like the disciples and, and brought to him your five loaves and two fish and trusted him to provide the resources so that way you can give it away to others. What would it look like if when we got home from work and we're about to enter into the chaos of our household, that we prayed to God and said, God, I give you my blank and I receive from you blank. God, I give you my tiredness, my anger, my resentments, and I receive from you your love and your life for my family. What if when we showed up at work in the morning, dreading the people we will see there and the task set before us and how impossible it is, and instead of just submitting to that and saying, I cannot wait to auction off my responsibilities or I'm gonna try my best, I'm gonna try, but I know I'm gonna run out. What if instead of that attitude, we remember the God who today can multiply food, the basic need, the basic sustenance, and trust him to multiply our energy, our hope, our joy? What if we had rhythms of rest that instead of sitting around watching Netflix all day, we went to the good, good father, and when we rested, we ate of him by reading his word and loving him, by worshiping him, by trusting in his version of rest instead of our own. You, do you really think that that might be actually like more effective than the way that we are regenerating? I think so. Take this time in prayer to think about the area of your life that is like 5,000 people asking for food, the area of your life that has so much need, it might be emotional, physical, spiritual, professional, financial, I don't know. Take that time right now in prayer to be honest and show up with your burden and ask for his abundance. I'll pray first. Father, we come to you as a church asking that you would have pity on us and compassion on us. And we come to you with our need. Father, I come to you with the need of, of doing my job well, of working at Gracious Savior, of trusting you with our children's ministry, which often struggles, and of trusting you with our outreach ministry, which is going well, and of trusting you with all the other little knickknacks of my job. I have a great need to be loving and compassionate to my coworkers, to the members of this church. In many of those ways, God, I'm, you've, you've given me abundance, but I have scarcity in, in, in one specific way, and that's our kids' ministry. And so God, if, if I were to work and just do more and do more, It'd be like five loaves and two fishes versus a thousand, five thousand people. And so, Father, I ask that you would come and, and take what I have, which isn't much. My love for your people, my fear also of failure, and my desire to love you, and my ignorance of what it's like to be a parent. <laughs> but I ask that you would take that. Multiply it into something good so that I can give it away to others. Just like your son did when he died for me. Father, I ask these things trusting in you and thanking you for providing what we need today abundantly. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may it guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord for life everlasting. And may you trust him to provide what you need abundantly.